Hi everyone, this is Catalin, and in today's episode we have Ivan Smolnikov. Ivan and I had a great, great conversation, uh, and I'm going to tell you about the key topics that you're going to learn in this podcast. But first, let me introduce Ivan. In 2004, he co-founded and built from scratch a company specializing in language solutions that later attracted a major translation company as a strategic investor. And then in 2016, uh, he spun out a company out of uh, his strategic investors company, which was called Abby, with double B and double Y, and he called it SmartCat. And SmartCat's mission is to make translations better for everyone. And what they're really doing is they're building an operating platform for the entire industry. And they connect linguists, companies, language survey providers, and they help them streamline the entire operation so they turn translation into basically a service that's on demand and low risk. As of September 2020, the platform has 350,000 freelancers in the marketplace, provides an app store, has a lot of clients, has a lot of traction. They just recently raised a big round. Well, you can argue big or small, but they raised a round of funding. And they're one of the few people that I know that the few companies that I know that are actually successful uh, in turning a service into a platform that's not simple. That's not a simple service like Uber and, and so and so some uh, and, and, and others. Uh, in this podcast, you'll learn what is SmartCat and how it revolutionized the translation industry by be by becoming the operating system and how exactly they went about doing that. You'll also learn how they solve the chicken and egg problem that so many marketplaces face. And I actually think they solve it in a very, very smart way. So you're going to learn about that in this podcast. Uh, you'll also learn what is a vertical market network and how is it different than a normal marketplace and why is the future of service marketplaces. And you'll also learn how SmartCat provides 10 times an order of magnitude better service in terms of benefit and cost to everybody involved on their platform. So hope you really enjoy the podcast. We're going to have links in the notes for some things that we are going to discuss. Please uh, make sure you share this with, with somebody that's working on building a company in, in complex services and turning them into a platform. There's going to be a lot of those that are be, going to be built. So really excited to see uh, people and what they're going to come out of this conversation. Thank you so much for listening and talk to you soon. Hi, everyone. Um, Ivan, thank you so much for uh, being with us today uh, and taking the time for the interview. Uh, I guess uh, my first question would be, uh, if, if you may, and I, I checked out your interviews and this was not discussed as much. I would really like, like to know before we get into your company now and what you're doing, how did you get into entrepreneurship in the first place? How did you get into the first company that you had? I know you're a, you're a physics guy and you have a physics degree, so that's not exactly the the type of person that you would be looking to turn into an entrepreneur. So really curious, before we get into the weeds and your companies mm -hmm. now and what you're doing, how did you get here in terms of your interest in building businesses yeah. and, and in this specific industry? By the way, thanks for, for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you, absolutely. And um, super excited to always share my experience, what I know, which is not much in my opinion, but still <laughs> this community. And um, yeah, I think that, you know, um, being an entrepreneur is not something that is directly uh, and um, literally connected to your degree or what you have been learning in university. That is probably something uh, that that is inside of you. And um, in my case, I, I was thinking about that like maybe 10 years ago, like what drives me? And that was always a passion to change things around you. It's like, you see that something doesn't work as it should. You just, uh, you believe you can change the reality. And it's really exciting. Like when you think, okay, that may work differently. That 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 thing may operate differently. And that was something inside of me. Um, and I just felt it. And um, when I was studying physics, it was really a strong, best uh, physics school in Russia, uh, um, like kind of MIT of Russia. And uh, I just, felt that I wanted to start something and accidentally uh, we with my friends came up with an idea to start something in translation and that was how my first company was born and after that the story you know began and uh, SmartCat was born like 
four years ago as a kind of consequence of all that experience in the industry after almost 10 years in the industry. So can you walk us through what is a smart cat? And I know you guys, you have an interesting story that it was initially born in the company that you were in and then spun out of that. So can you describe how that process went of coming up first with the idea of it, of what is now a separate company, a very successful company, I might add at this point in time. Um, and how did that whole process go? Oh, first, and what, um, is, what is smart cat yeah. would, be, would be good to start with? Sorry, apologies. Yeah. Um, look, yeah, let me try to probably a bit give you some context. And if I go too much into the weeds, just, you know, tell me and we will try to make it more high level. But we are, what we are trying to do, we are trying to solve a very big problem. We are trying to transform how the entire language industry operates. And language industry, it's about translation from one language into another. And this is a $50 billion industry globally. At least it, it used to be $50 billion industry before COVID. I don't know exactly where it is today, but it seems like it hasn't changed much, maybe like 10, 15%, but overall it's still working. It's, it's alive. It's not like travel. We will not hit uh, as travel, uh, you know, as much as travel. So it's like big industry and uh, there are three major uh, actors or participants in this industry and buyers. So you can think about any brand that want to sell something uh, abroad. Uh, no matter where you are, you may want to sell something abroad. And the problem you have to solve is you have to localize your product, which assumes all the content around this product, interfaces, marketing communications, websites, you know, knowledge bases, a lot of different types of content, which usually travels to um, consumers through different channels. So these are different forms and types of content. And uh, the second big uh, you know, participant, target audience in this industry are, uh, are agencies. These are primarily small companies like three, five, ten people. There are 50,000 agencies out there in the world. And what they do, they do kind of sales, accounting, uh, they um, manage relationships with buyers. And then they usually hire freelancers uh, in all different countries, manage these freelancers to deliver final translation of the content to an end buyer. Um, and they entirely rely almost 100% on freelancers. And these freelancers are in different countries. You can't hire freelancers who translate into 10 languages in China. Uh, you have to hire Chinese freelancers in China, but uh, someone who will be translating into French should probably be in France, you know. Um, so, and the last piece, last mile freelancers, like millions, maybe million and a half of freelancers, and they are all working together. And this supply chain or value delivery chain, it's very long usually. It starts from, from a brand, then it may go to a big agency, then this agency may outsource something to a bunch of small agencies, and then it goes to freelancers. And through this, you know, long supply chain signal, is not really, you know, well traveling, quality um, deteriorating usually, prices are high. And that is all happening in the age when we need information to travel immediately, when we have to have continuous delivery for uh, our content, original content, but we don't have it for multilingual content. So that is the industry landscape, essentially. And what Smartcat uh, does is actually we try to build uh, fully um, comprehensive and operational platform for all these three parties that automates how they uh, manage their workflow, how they are deliver multilingual content, and we also automate the process of translation itself. We allow actually to accumulate data and then reuse data on the next step, which makes the cost of translation much lower. And the complexity is that first we have three target audiences. Uh, so the products are essentially different for them, but at the same time, they have to work together seamlessly, like a holistic platform. And uh, so three different target audiences, and also we combine SaaS, we combine FinTech, we have industry-specific FinTech component allowing to make transactions uh, in all different directions to all these people around the globe. And we have a huge marketplace of freelancers and agencies. 
And the combination of these parts is pretty unique because it allows you to essentially create an oper operational system for entire industry and enable all these market participants to work together on a single platform, solving all these the problems connected with multilingual content delivery in a single place. And that is how we believe we can create much better industry, which is much more effective, transparent, and uh, finally more cost effective for all participants. So that is SmartCat, and that is a big ambition, and that is a big, big complex product because it, you know, consists of essentially, I would say, probably nine different products at least, three target audiences, three different products for each of them, and the combination of it uh, can be whatever you want. Um, so that is that is where SmartCat stands. Um, but uh, you also were asking like how it all started uh, from my previous company. Uh, let, if we can go there, or you want to, let, let's to stop. interrupt me for a second? <laughs> yeah, let's let's stop here for a second, just so I. Um, no, actually, you go ahead. Let's let's go through the how it all started and why did you guys separate the company from the initial uh, corporation that it was in, which was a, well a traditional bigger company, if I if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And 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 I have some notes, but I'll go through those after because it seems like there's a there's a good flow here. So what do you think? <clears throat> It's, it started actually, as I said, uh, when I was, <clears throat> excuse me, graduating from my university, um, uh, we decided with my friends to set up the kind of translation agency. You remember one of these uh, constituencies in the industry are translation agencies. And that was 2004. And the idea was that we want to build something online. Uh, at the time, we, our industry didn't have online translation agencies. So you can go and buy translation uh, on the website, pay by card, everything will be calculated automatically. And we tried to do that and we started doing that. And quite quickly in maybe two, three years, we had uh, a strategic investor, which was AB Software, which bought uh, a significant portion of our company in just three years. But still, um, I continued to work in that company because I still had a huge, uh, pretty not huge, but significant share in the business. And I ran that company, ran that company from 2006 until 2016 for, for 10 years and grew it into one of the largest agencies globally, actually. It was in top 50 by all different rankings. And out of 50,000 agencies, it's kind of kind of an achievement, but it's not a huge corporation. You should be clear about it. It's like 300 people. It's more or less, you know, medium-sized business. <clears throat> and SmartCat initially was born as a response to our own need to automate how we operated. So in 2012, 2011, it became clear that everything, you know, moves to the cloud. And at the time, we in the industry didn't have a cloud-based effective software that would allow you to enable collaboration between multi multiple participants, uh, such as freelancers in different countries who could work together at the same time. And we just decided to create such software in the cloud. That was first idea, very simple, very practical for our own purposes. But then uh, we started thinking, okay, this industry relies so heavily on freelancers. All these agencies, they work with freelancers and even small agency can deal with like 50, sometimes 100 freelancers every month. And they don't even know how many freelancers they, they deal with every month. So they can't actually pay for software in traditional model, you know, for each user, for each seat. Per, per, per seat model doesn't work effectively. But I think that it was kind of inherited from um, enterprise software and everyone was selling uh, software in translation industry to automate the process, charging for each user, which didn't really work well. And uh, that is why majority of agencies until today probably are not using anything. They just, you know, translating in Microsoft Word uh, without even knowing that they, they could save like 50% of, of the cost because they could reuse repetitions. Uh, and uh, also it was hard to sell uh, for software vendors. So an Id idea was like, what if we make our cloud application, which is super effective and collaborative, and we will just give it for free. We will give it away for free. And then the next question of course, of course how, how it will become a business, right? And uh, in this industry, the answer is pretty on the surface. You know, uh, it's a $50 billion industry where 90, probably 8% of money is being spent in services, not on software. 
So if you want to build a successful transformative business, you should be thinking, and that probably applicable for many other service industries, how you can actually make money um, from essentially services, but probably not becoming one more service provider. That is the probably biggest question. If you just go and start uh, building one more service provider in, the, in, in an industry like ours, which is very fragmented, you'll be competing with all these agencies directly. They won't be supportive to you. So you can't essentially create value for a very big participant in this industry. But our goal is was to give them all software and uh, make them more effective and entice them essentially to operate on our platform. But if we are competing with them, they wouldn't go. So Marketplace was kind of an answer for us. We, we tried to provide software for free and that worked as a natural attractor for all freelancers and agencies. But simultaneously, we were building Marketplace where every buyer, including agencies themselves and brands as well, they could hire other vendors such as other agencies or freelancers. And that became a monetization channel. But in addition to that, unexpectedly for myself, we also came up with FinTech component. And um, if you think about other industries, the best analogy would be, not be an analogy, but the idea here is very simple. Uh, every agency and every end customer, they usually come to the platform to use software first, and they can come with their own vendors, they, with their pre-existing network of suppliers. And uh, to monetize these relationships, we introduced very robust FinTech component, which automates all accounts payable for them, all accounts receivable. We essentially allow them to pay one invoice in, 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 in a local currency, and then we distribute money to like 100 freelancers in different countries, very, very, um, in a very low cost manner. So these are three uh, components that came together and they allowed us to really build a new business model for, for the service vertical. And at the same time, they allowed us to really uh, build strong monetization when software monetization for traditional software mo model wasn't the, the purpose. After that, we also introduced some premium subscriptions, but core free component still most attractive for our users and they can just jump on it and start using it for free. Yeah. So that is the, the background. And then we spun out the company just because essentially these are two different businesses. You can't stay in agency and continue building the transformative platform for all other agencies, freelancers and, and buyers in this industry. Was it because the uh, the people that would be using the platform were having like doubts about your motives because you were competing with them in the first place? So you kind of had to have a, like a separate independent company yeah. just to have no conflict of interest? <clears throat> Yeah, that's, that's actually the, the major reason, absolutely, mm -hmm. because, uh, as I said, that was an agency business, mm -hmm. and you can't actually uh, motivate and sell something to other agencies, which are major market players and participants, if you continue being an agency yourself. And there are multiple examples in this industry, uh, which is pretty interesting. I don't know if it works a similar way in other industries, but one example would be that a company tried to create some software being an agency and then software didn't become popular just because other agencies would be jealous and they would be suspicious to use it. And another another thing which is happening quite often is that company starts as a software company in this industry, but then they were not able to sustain high growth rate just selling software and they switch to become an agency because it's easier in the beginning, you know, so essentially, if you are trying to transform your your respective B two B service vertical, you should be thinking how not to to get into this trap, how not to become an agency at some point, because it might seem like an easier money, it might seem like a, a better opportunity, but at least in our industry, the problem is that the industry can't be transformed if you are becoming just just uh, you know one more agency you should be something different uh, to introduce transformative tools and ways of working for all existing market participants. Yeah. Uh, so for the people that are, and we're going to have this in the show notes, you wrote this article on Medium uh, called on basically 
I know I'm not sure if you coined the term, but you you called what you're doing a vertical market network. Um, and I found that article to be rather really cool. And there's actually, funnily enough, there's a bunch of VCs now that are coining different things, but they're basically saying the same thing as you, uh, just with a, let's say, a 12, 16-month delay. And they're calling it different names, but they're basically talking about the same thing, um, which is rather funny. But just for the people listening, and we're going to have a link to your Medium article because I think it's really helpful. Um Basically, what you're doing is instead of just doing discovery, which is what most marketplaces do, like Upwork and uh, Freelancer.com and all major marketplaces, which is just facilitate the people meeting and then that's it. And then they become useless, which has a bunch of problems. Uh, What you're doing, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm reiterating so you can build on top of it, is you're offering workflow solutions. You're you're offering a payment solution or the fintech component because you're offering them, you're building up this network, then you start monetizing them by providing, I think, matching maybe. And then, uh, of course, the discovery is embedded into it. That's that's a given. Like, am I getting it right? Yeah. Yeah, you, you're basically getting it right. I, I would, you know, try to explain it in, in the simple following way. Um, we are talking here about the um, complicated multi-stage services, B2B services. We are not talking about a simple service such as writing, for example. If you want to get from point A to point B, it's like it's it's a very simple workflow. It's one stage. You are usually you usually as a user don't care about a driver. It's it's what you care about is like meeting the same quality standard and uh, getting from point A to point B in a predictable manner. That is a very simple service. It's easy to transform how this type of service is being t- rendered. Uh, it, it's easy to introduce something new here, quite easy in my mind. But the problem is usually with multi-stage B2B services. Think about legal services or consulting services or, I don't know, translation services like in our case. Usually translation service is about group of people working together and also this service have workflow, has workflow with multiple stages. It can be like 15 translators working on one language pair then five editors, then some reviewers, in-country reviewers who are, you know, reviewing your content in Japan. So that is like, you know, sounds like an authentic content for for Japanese people. Um, And and that is very complex workflow and it can be multiplied by several languages. That is one problem. Second problem is that usually corporations, companies, they have some specific software for a particular vertical. So if it's about translation, they have already uh, used something that if they are you know sophisticated buyer they have already used something that allows them to reuse what they translated before so they are not overpaying again and again so some specific software is in the chain and that is why you can't just transform the way they buy the service introducing a catalog of freelancers in front of them or catalog of agencies it doesn't help you can solve the matching problem so you can help me as a buyer to select some new vendors but if i have already pre-established workflow somehow working in my corporation. It can be purchasing work- workflow and then it can be special software for this type of service. Then I will take this vendor and go into my workflow. And that is where your value as a, as a, as a catalog will disappear because essentially you will provide me this initial matching. I will buy maybe first time, but then I want these vendors to actually be in my workflow. That is why uh, I believe as an entrepreneur who is uh, thinking about the transformation of the entire service vertical, you need to think how the processes actually work today. How you will be able with your software, with your SaaS software, to introduce the way that will be more appealing and effective for enterprises, for companies in the end of the day, so that they can migrate the entire workflow to your platform. And after that, matching and transactions and everything just come naturally because they are a kind of, you know, natural consequence of your of you collaborating with with these vendors. But if you go um, in opposite direction, which is cheaper, easier, easier to start, less investment, some early traction, it's not sustainable because you can't retain these relationships. It will be one off transaction and it's done. And that is the biggest problem for for a marketplace or for a transformational platform. Essentially, just never become a transformational platform. 
Yeah, and there's there's no it's known fact for public companies like Upwork and uh, companies like that they have huge problems with keeping people on the platform just because the their fee doesn't make the, the doesn't justify itself after the matching has happened. Um so that's that's really yeah. you go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it, you know, it may work because uh, and they obviously are successful. They they built a successful public company and um, they are doing something something right. Uh, and, and the difference is that they are horizontal. They have all different verticals in one place. So finally, you can make some very good money and you can have some good growth trajectory with this approach because some some verticals can work this way pretty well but majority can't and if you think for example about language translation vertical uh, they were not able to migrate you know any meaningful material portion of buyers to their platform just because they don't have this workflow which is specific for this particular vertical mm -hmm. it doesn't exist on their platform it's generic for all verticals but it doesn't make sense to me to use it for translation because I need specific software, I need specific approach, and so on and so forth. So it just doesn't help to really um, transform the way how people operate in multiple different um, service verticals. So by looking at the value chain, uh, what's the current workflow? By looking at the products that would be needed for them just to hand you everything and you can take care of the whole thing for them, more or less, um, then that allows them to have a really good motivation for change, it seems to me. Um, and it also allows you to be able to solve the marketplace problem that everybody's having, which is you're you're just you're just gonna I think you said in a different interview that ninety eight percent of of the users on your platform come for the technology, and then you have this network and then you can just match yeah. people together and that's that's the value that it brings. So that's incredibly smart, I guess. Um, well, I don't guess for sure. So in, when you guys were planning this out, because this is a huge tech investment and it's probably one of the reasons that the small players don't do them because it takes a lot of money to develop really good tools for the workflow components that are in place. Um, have you guys, like, was your strategy to just like build the whole thing out from scratch? I'm sure there would there would have, would have been potential acquisitions to be made uh, and like small mm -hmm. products that are working on smaller problems and then bringing them together, but maybe that wasn't as productive. I'm just curious because it seems like um, if you're trying to solve the entire workflow, then that means we need $25 million in development. Maybe not, I'm just exaggerating, to be able to have the solution, but um, I'm pretty sure you guys didn't do that. So did you guys look at acquisition? Yeah. How did you play <laughs> play that? Yeah. You know, I, I'm not sure that if if our our way actually of doing that can be and should be modeled here, it may be not optimal. But in fact, you are almost right that we put a lot of money in the beginning. It wasn't 25 million dollars, but it was like five or six million dollars that we invested, essentially from uh, our own money in the beginning uh, with uh, me and some of my co-founders in the in the early stage. Uh, and we could do that because we were doing that from our previous business. So we essentially took profit from the previous business and we put it into this platform for several years. And why I believe it might not be optimal, because today I would say that with my current experience and the, you know, looking backward is usually easier. You know, you already know how to mitigate all these different errors. Uh, I would say that it could be done cheaper. Uh, but still, this approach, this, any platform business, if you want to build an ecosystem, if you want to build a platform that transforms how entire industry or ecosystem out there operates today, you need to build some uh, big thing in the beginning, and you need to put a lot of money in the beginning. And I think that it's very possible to actually raise this money from the markets. Uh, you can see today that companies raised like sometimes $10 million for the seed round. It wasn't possible 10 years ago, but today it still happens, you know, during COVID even. And if you can raise like five, 10 millions for the seed round, you of course can do that. You, you can build some foundational thing. You won't be able to build everything, but it's not needed. You need something in the core that will create some traction. And in our case, that was very, very core workflow, how you actually translate. And that workflow attracted a lot of freelancers because for the, for the first time ever, they could use something as robust as our product, but for free. 
In the beginning, we didn't have much differentiation. We were just free. We were as good as other products on the market, but free. And it was in the cloud, fresh UI, you know, easier to use. That was one thing. And second, uh, agencies and buyers and buyers, they came for the same, but a bit later because in the beginning product wasn't mature enough and even free wasn't a big, a big enough incentive. So maybe a year or year and a half later, after the first traction in freelance segment, we saw agencies and end customers also jumping on the platform. And after that, it's still a long journey. You need to invest more money before you cover this whole supply chain with all different components, which is very long. But that is what you need to do. Otherwise, you can't create really operational system for the entire industry. And if you, at least again, in our case, we don't believe in the situation when we just build a platform for one audience. We, we have to be in the very complex environment where we are building product, which is great simultaneously for three different market uh, participants, such as agencies, freelancers, and brands. That is very difficult. That is, that is actually um, distracts you a lot and entrepreneurs should be focused at least at the early stages. And it's very expensive, but uh, that is the only way to uh, create value uh, of that scale that we want to create for the entire industry. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And would you say right now, so if you're looking at, um, so that makes a lot of sense. And this, this definitely seems like one of those problems that should be solved with the financials at the core so that you can look at like how much money does you need to do? What, what are the essential things you need to be building? And how much money you need to for those in order to extract value and then build the rest of the rest of these things? Because a lot of people look at the like kind of these sequential um, way of building businesses. Like they look at Tesla, like oh, they, you build an expensive car for this audience, then you make money, then you invest into infrastructure, build a cheaper car and cheaper cheaper car. But when you're getting into software, like what you're doing, that gets that's a lot more nuanced um, and, and a lot. I think a lot more abstract to to get down because with physical products it's just very obvious what you do um so two uh two questions well actually i'll ask the first one is what you're doing um the what's the delta of value in terms of the service that you're providing uh compared to normal alternative is it like an order of magnitude better i know you talked in a different uh interview about translation memory and how you don't repeat things and just because of that you can get 60 70 percent uh, discounts as it compared to normal, but like, what's the delta of of effort or or the delta of value in in terms of yeah. the service itself? Altogether, uh, it's actually I think roughly ten x. Uh, so so you can be ten x more effective uh, if you deploy all the components. Uh, first, the the biggest benefit comes from the software itself because. You can easily uh, cut your budget by three, four times actually, three, four x. Just and, and that is not probably unique in the sense that such software existed before. You could reuse uh, translation memory um, using desktop applications, but the problem was that uh, in if you use client-server application, it's actually hard to accumulate all your linguistic assets, all your translation memory databases in one place, and to reuse it across all your projects happening in different teams, in different file formats, you know, and channels. But in the cloud, you can centralize it much easier. You can create really effective uh, continuous delivery process that is plugged in into your infrastructure, and essentially it works automatically. It's just going through API, and uh, you you don't lose any data. All the data works for you, and this way you can save up to like seventy percent easily. Mm -hmm. But the second order comes from you being able to choose from all the best suppliers on the market. Usually, if you just deal with a single agency, you don't have that exposure. You, you don't know for sure how much you save even on your translation memory and how this agency compares to all other 20,000 agencies out there. And it's not that I'm not saying that an agency will be cheating you. It's just you don't have real exposure. So you don't know how much the most relevant for you uh, the most relevant agency for you in China, for example, would charge you compared to that uh, agency in, in the UK that covers for you both Chinese, Vietnamese, Turkish, and, and French. 
you, you need to have that knowledge and you have you need to have this transparency to make a decision. And that is second thing. And the last thing is actually how much you save on operations. Um, some enterprises, they, they run big teams to, you know, to do localization for them. And they, they actually spend a lot on project management uh, because people doing a lot manually with files, you know, they're running all together, you know, moving files. And uh, if they hire uh, several dozens of freelancers or agencies, then they pay invoices to all different countries in diff using different payment methods. And that also, you know, takes a lot of time. But when it's all automated, you have the probably third, um, um, third contribution here when you save additional like 10, 20%, and all together it can be that it's like 10x cheaper, 10x more effective. But, but the beauty of our case is that it doesn't, by, by no means, it actually leads to um, a lower spend overall because all enterprises, they have a lot of content. Content is exploding but they have budget limitations. So you have a like, huge volume of content and you have then bottleneck, which is your budget. So what happens is that they just put more content into the same budget. So they still spend same money, but they just now able out of sudden to translate to localize like 10X more content, which makes them more effective selling to different countries. And essentially that leads to growth finally, because it's easier to make a decision uh, now when it's so much more effective. That's so cool. That's so cool. And what came to mind when you said that was, uh, so thank you for sharing that, was there's this um, uh, startup <clears throat> founded by uh, Justin Khan, I think is his name, that completely failed, $75 million in funding that was trying to do the service marketplace for, for legal services. And the problem they had from my analysis, because they weren't quite clear on the press on this, is that Every single time they became more effective, they transferred that effectiveness into the price of the client. So they were not rewarded for their effectiveness in, in truth. So what I was thinking is, this feels to me like what you're doing. It is, uh, so for example, I'm, I'm, I, I have an agency and I have a marketing company and there is a lot of cost-based pricing, but there's also opportunities in which you can do outcome or value-based pricing, like, hey, we'll give you $1 million worth of growth and you'll pay us 100,000. So that, that's like a huge lifesaver, but it requires some things to be put in place. I'm yeah. assuming for your industry, because there's like budget-based and whatever, it is cost-based. Um, so how do you avoid, number one, the race to the bottom question, like just getting cheaper and cheaper? And right now you have a huge gap between your price and everybody else, so you probably have a huge leeway, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, but how do you avoid yeah. that that race to the bottom of pass of, of doing that? And then how do you not pass down the effectiveness to the client because that decreases your profitability? That that's kind of a trick thing. Does that make any, any sense to you? Hmm. Yeah, it, it, it makes sense. Uh, let me think for a second about it. I think that uh, the probably difference in our case is that software has huge component in this effectiveness. Uh, so if you only try to make human services cheaper, it's it's a wrong way because you don't want to squeeze uh, people who are finally uh, producing this service. Quite the opposite. What happens in our platform is that, for example, freelancers earn more. And we want actually agencies to earn more as well. And that is already happening just because they become capable to produce higher volumes uh, with the same amount of people in the team, the same amount of project managers. Uh, we, we are now verifying and validating for them that they become like two times more profitable usually. They, they can uh, have higher margin, even though they can decrease prices. Wow. And for, for an end customer, it's a good question. Like why in the end it's, it won't be balanced to, to the, to the level when, uh, when actually it, it won't become profitable, uh, for, for us as well and for other market participants. I think the answer here is that there are two components that are very important here. First, this software component that produces a lot of value by itself. For example, in, in writing business, software component is just a utility thing, right? It doesn't, it doesn't allow you to move faster because you use the Uber application, you are not moving faster from point A to point B, right? 
and it doesn't allow a driver to save uh, gas actually uh, while he or she is driving you, right? Uh, in our cases, it's not true. In our case, by using our software, all parties start benefiting. And sometimes they are benefiting in a different way, actually. Um, I, I, I won't be going much into detail here, but the key point is the following. Even though an enterprise accumulate all their linguistic assets in their account, they only use what belongs to them, their data. And now if you are a service vendor, such an agency, such as an agency or a freelancer, you also accumulate linguistic assets that you, um, that you produced before, but it's not the same linguistic assets with an enterprise. So you actually have, you can have your own leverage and enterprise can have its own leverage and software provides a lot of value here. And that is first thing. And second thing, uh, we don't believe that uh, humans won't be needed in this uh, value chain in the nearest future. We see that language is a very complex problem. And even though machine translation becomes much uh, more and more um, uh, better and better all the time, you know, uh, still it doesn't substitute for people. And people are needed in this supply chain. And people, you, you can't actually um, put a lot of pressure on them so that they charge you twice less per hour because there is limited number of professional linguists in the world. And this is this number is not growing, but the content volume is growing. So it's kind of disparity here. And in such a market, you can definitely create valuable business that will be growing and the market is growing and the business will be growing and your profit won't be uh, going not nowhere. But maybe it's not true for every business but my, my general answer would be, you need to find a way how uh, software creates a lot of value. Otherwise, uh, you are in trouble potentially. And second, um, the service ideally shouldn't be commoditized. Uh, in, in our case, it actually, uh, what helps is that content volume is growing. The number of people who are serving this content actually stays the same. Uh, it's not that the language uh, language industry is that appealing that uh, we have more and more people coming into it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much the same. But we make these people more productive with software and they can do uh, more and more work. Absolutely. So it, it that's that's fascinating. Um, so and that's really insightful. What I was thinking is what will be my next thing is, for example, the... Um, from from the conversations I know with the again the industry I know, which is the marketing industry, which is again highly fragmented in the same type of discussion, the freelancers and agencies not is not that they want clients, is that that they want clients enough clients they can handle. So it's like on they don't want like a waterfall of clients. They want clients on tap. Maybe that's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah the, the good one. I yeah. like it actually. I, I use it as well. Oh yeah, that's that's cool. <laughs> Um, they, they, they want to have this tab, you know, they just sit in front of the platform, they, they open the tab and they have enough customers that are relevant for them. In our, in our industry, relevancy is very important. You, you don't want to deal in marketing with customers who are from a different field, right? Who are asking you to do something that you are not expert in. Same, same in our industry. Freelancers and agencies are very specialized usually. They are very narrow in their expertise. So that's that's interesting. So my question was, and then we're gonna to go to some other stuff, and I'll let you go in about five to seven minutes. But thank you for the for the for your time. My uh, my question is, how do you keep them happy? Like, do you have, for example, like here we have three hundred thousand people on our platform, freelancers plus agencies. Let's say thirty thousand get work first, and then fifty thousand get work second, based on history. And like, how do you keep them? Uh, happy really because you can't have the on tap function for 300,000 people that yeah. seems unrealistic yeah. yeah I think the key answer for us and that's probably our not our original but I believe very good way to solve what is called in marketplaces chicken egg problem it's a free, so the free software that we have it's very valuable so when you when I give you free software that you love and you used to pay for, and also you can use it for free working for your own customers. Imagine that you are a freelancer. You come to our platform, 
usually just because you heard that we have great software, you can use it for free and you will be much more effective and productive working with your own customers independently of customers we will give you. And that is how you, you become happy. Also, you want on top of that to get some customers from us, but it's not that in uh, uh, like it happens in traditional marketplaces. If you don't give you customers, you are disappointed and you leave. It's, it's a bonus. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a bonus. Go ahead, sorry. So you will be happy. You will be happy when we give you uh, jobs. Same for agencies. Agencies are ninety percent of agencies come to our platform because we provide the most effective operational system to run their business. We are the only product today in the industry that allows them to run everything uh, using our all-in-one platform. In, in other cases, you need to buy three, four different products, somehow connect them. Uh, they are loosely connected and they are not effective. And you can use it for free or you can pay some for some premium, um, uh, premium features, but these features still uh, will be, uh, the product will be much ahead of any other competition and the product will be cheaper for you. And that is your major value. Now, when you can also get some business through the platform, you, you become even happier, right? Uh, but it's not that you will leave if you don't get it. Absolutely. So, uh, so they're already satisfied in economic terms by the software yeah. they're getting. And then yeah. the, the cherries on top are they're getting clients, but they're not going to be sitting yeah. there and waiting. That's so cool. So you can, you can be in that position that you're sitting and waiting, but, that, but you are not in, in the mainstream for us uh, in this case, because this software, it's so powerful and so valuable that it's a major attractor on our platform. And this allows actually to solve chicken egg problem. We, we don't chase um, suppliers, actually, they come to us. We don't pay for supply acquisition usually. Um, and, and, and we want the same to, be, to happen with buyers, actually. So they get value out of software, they set up this collaboration. And only after that, matching just comes naturally. It takes longer, uh, it takes more time, it, it takes uh, you, know, you to invest more. But when it works, retention is just very different. You don't have a problem of retention after that once both parties are using your, your software. And it, it feels to me that the, the value in your marketplace works all the way. So if you get an agency, they can hire freelancers. They can sub they can subcontract yeah. to other agencies too. So the value just like there's yes. so many, it's like a complex and, web. And, and, they, and they, they, they can be hired by end buyers in parallel with, uh, with freelancers. So agencies, they are both buyers and suppliers in our ecosystem. Yeah, that's that's really cool. So uh, two final questions, Ivan, and I'll, I'll let you go. Um, <clears throat> well, actually three, but the last one, it's, it's uh, more logistical. So uh, what are you most excited about in your company's future that you would like to share with us? Like what it is that maybe you're thinking of doing and like, yes, I'm really excited about doing that. Like I'm really excited to solve this problem because it's already feels to me that you guys have figured out the base, the foundation layer of the problem. I, I It feels to me that you have a pretty good grip on the freelancer market. Like you have a lot of people on your platform. So it doesn't seem like 10 xing the freelancer base would be the solution to the next level. So I'm curious, what's the next level for you guys or what you're excited about solving or the next... Uh, I mean, the next thing. Uh, yeah, let, let me try to answer first. I think that uh, on, on the kind of vision level, the most exciting thing for me is that I believe that people create so much uh, interesting innovations every day in different countries. It's just happening all the time. But at the same time, ideas don't travel equally uh, to, to other countries uh, because mm. of the language barrier. And I think that that is just because it used to be, the service used to be so complicated. If you need to go to a traditional agency and or hire a freelancer yourself somewhere in China to translate into Chinese and pay somehow, then organize the whole process. That is actually the major stopper for uh, ideas distribution. And um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about learning new things. I'm very enthusiastic about learning all the time. And I believe it's a big value if we can provide platform where every business, every innovation can be just plugged in and then can be distributed in other languages. So that is a high level motivation. On more practical level, what is next for us? Actually, I 
we, we haven't completed our mission of transforming how entire industry operates. We are we are fast growing company. We are kind of successful. I'm pretty humble guy. You know, I, I can't you know usually say like, oh, we we have done it already. No, it's a long long journey in front of us. Uh, but I think that the biggest value comes from automated matching that is not working ideally yet. And when you think about fragmentation in supply chain, uh, so uh, the final freelancer can translate in a specific language pair for a specific domain in a particular price range. So if someone is a professional translating from English into Italian in, um, I don't know, legal, he or she won't be that great translating in automotive, probably. And we need to somehow figure out how to give you the best vendor automatically for your content. And if you know the answer already, but I can't tell you that this answer works at scale. I believe that is a game changer for the industry because it will allow to be so much more effective, both for buyers and agencies and suppliers. And probably the last piece, um, I believe that finally uh, we need to figure out also how to make content creation more automatic. Because quite often you don't need to translate something, you just want to create uh, original content in Japanese, maybe referring to your original content in English. And I think that that is, that is even a bigger problem that the solution for which doesn't exist at the moment. And we haven't proceeded even to, to do that yet. But that is something that actually excites me when I think about it personally. And I think that that is kind of next generation of, uh, of technologies and marketplaces that potentially can work together and maybe we can solve also in the future. That's so cool. Um... And I love, uh, just a final note on that, I love how you, so if we define progress as the velocity of ideas exchange, then you, by removing yeah. the language barrier, you're increasing the velocity, the speed at which ideas can travel, which is a, yeah. a fundamental need for progress. So that's really cool uh, in terms of vision, because you can connect it to something that's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how many things are more fundamental than that. Um, in terms of progress. So that's really fascinating. And thank you for, for the, the work that you're doing because I, I didn't it's, even it's, think it's of that. Aligned with your, with your internal value. And my internal value is that you always need to progress. You, you always need to evolve as a human being, uh, as a civilization. We, we are doing that, right? It's some, something, you know, we are wired to do that somehow. Somehow we are driven by, by progress and evolution, right? And if I can make a contribution so that it happens uh, more effectively and... Uh, uh, doesn't have uh, impediments like uh, outdated legacy architectures or long supply chains or ineffective processes, that's great. And that is direct contribution to ideas spreading, to ideas sharing. Yeah, absolutely. So that's absolutely brilliant. Um, so um, final note, where can people learn more about you, the company, if there's any uh, I, I mean, if there's any, if you want to give any contact out, I mean, we're going to have your LinkedIn profile and your website, but if there's any message of what you want to leave people with or how they can contact you or anything like that. Um, I, I'm actually using most of uh, social media that are out there, but probably the easiest way is LinkedIn. I, I also, from time to time, use Facebook, but uh, not, my, not that much Twitter. Uh, that's probably it. Uh, also, the website is smartcat dot com it's easy um yeah i think that that's probably it but if you drop me a message on linkedin or facebook uh, i will definitely will be able to read it and we'll try to to get back to you yes uh thank you well ivan thank you so much for your time really appreciate the insightful conversation i'm sure people have gotten a lot of value because i i, I want to thank you for the clear-headedness that you express your ideas in the physics background may come into play with that. I don't know exactly, but there's you, your ideas are very clear. So it's, it's, it's very interesting to see that and very valuable. So thank you so much for, uh, for your time and added value and really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It was my, my pleasure talking to you. It was interesting conversation and it feels like you are very interested in the topic. So it's great to talk to such people, you know, when you feel that someone is interested, it's easy <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to give you everything you want. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan.
Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.